Hi, my name is Sharon Chen, and I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician at Stanford University. This video is on how microbes colonize or establish infection. It is part of our Introduction to Microbiology series. After entering the host, pathogens must colonize a specific niche in order to establish an infection. Colonization usually involves avoiding the host barriers and clearance mechanisms that protect us from invasion. The stage of the infectious life cycle takes place during the incubation period, which is silent and without clinical symptoms. The learning objectives are to describe how pathogens reach a location to establish an infection, to explain the different mucosal clearance mechanisms that pathogens must overcome, to explain different ways in which microbial attachment is involved in pathogenesis, to discuss how microbes cross the epithelial barrier to establish infection, and to describe how pathogens invade cells. I will first discuss how microbes reach a particular location, and then I'll discuss how attachment, crossing the epithelial barrier, and invading cells are involved in establishing infection. I'll give you examples from bacteria, fun viral, fungal, and parasitic infections. Once a microbe has entered the host, it needs to reach its preferred location. This may involve active motility and sensing by the microbe. In the case of bacteria, there are multiple mechanisms of directed movement. The most prominent is flagellar motility coupled to chemotaxis. Flagella are appendages that propel the bacteria as they swim. The picture you see here is of Helicobacter pylori, a bacteria that colonizes the stomach and has flagella for movement. In the movie, Helicobacter pylori swim randomly until a needle releases an attractant. Their ability to respond and concentrate at the source is called chemotaxis. The combination of flagella motility and chemotaxis allows Helicobacter pylori to avoid being killed by acid and to reach the surface of the stomach epithelium, its preferred location. In contrast to bacteria, neither viruses nor pathogenic fungi can move on their own. Yet, they are still very good at establishing infection. Virus and fungi can reach their preferred sites of infection by random diffusion called Brownian motion and by the flow of body fluids. So here you can see a movie of Brownian motion. Fungi can invade tissue by growing hyphae. The video shows you growing hyphae. This is not movement, but it sure looks like it. Now, next time you see a patient with a mold infection, you might be able to imagine hyphae growing in your patient and invading into a blood vessel. Parasites refer to both single-cell protozoa as well as multicellular organisms, and they each have distinct types of motility. Some protozoa move using specialized appendages called cilia. Others, like amoeba, crawl by extending pseudopodia. Another way is called gliding motility. And in the video, you can see a stage of the protozoa called plasmodium that causes malaria, and it's gliding over a surface. This is a stage that the mosquito injects into the skin. The parasite uses this movement to enter blood or lymph vessels, to glide over the surface of endothelial cells, and eventually reach liver cells and invade. Helminths and arthropods use muscles to move. And here you can see a free-swimming schistosome cercaria trying to penetrate the skin. It first uses its tail to reach the skin and then loses it as it penetrates the epidermis. It then crawls into deeper tissues. Eventually, it will travel through the body and establish an infection in the liver. Colonization involves more than just movement because the body can be a very harsh environment to a microbe. The mucosal surface is equipped with numerous mechanisms to prevent microbes from getting in. Tight junctions, which you can see by the arrow, glue cells together, creating a really tight barrier that doesn't allow microbes to penetrate. Microbes need to interact with the cell in order to invade, but mucus secreted by specialized cells separate microbes from the cell surface. Some epithelia, like respiratory epithelium, have cilia. And cilia pushes the mucus and the trap microbes outward. In the gastrointestinal tract, microbes need to overcome the peristalsis that transports contents out. Our bodies produce numerous microbicidal chemicals. 
The human stomach is a vat of acid that can reach a pH of 1 and destroy most microbes. This is followed by a shower of bile in the duodenum that functions as a detergent, stripping membranes off of organisms and envelope viruses. Finally, there are specialized molecules secreted to injure microbes, such as antimicrobial peptides that poke holes in bacteria, uh, lysozyme that digests the cell wall, and antibodies like secreted IgA or immunoglobulin A that specifically bind to microbial structures. Once they reach their preferred location, microbes have multiple mechanisms to attach and avoid clearance. Attachment is so important for pathogens that they have molecules and appendages for this purpose. Attachment is often essential for disease, and thus they're considered virulence factors. So for example, E. coli is a commensal colonizing our large intestine. Some strains have evolved pili that can attach to the surface of cells lined in the urinary bladder, and these are called uropathogenic E. coli. You can see the pili in the diagram. It's the brown structure sticking out of the bacteria. The strains that have these pili are responsible for most urinary tract infections. Other bacteria use surface molecules as adhesins rather than pili. For example, the bacteria Bordetella pertussis that causes whooping cough can directly attach to cilia in our airways, as you can see in this drawing. Amazingly, these cilia are the same structures that would clear most other microbes. Attachment is not just important for bacteria. For viruses, it often determines which cells they can invade. Viral infection of specific cell types is called viral tropism. This is often determined by the specific attachment of viral surface molecules to host cell receptors. Only cells that express the receptors can be infected. An important example of this is influenza, a virus that infects our airway epithelial cells by binding to sialic acid residues on glycosylated membrane proteins. You can see the attachment of the blue structure, which is the viral surface molecule, to the blue sphere, which represents sialic acid residues. This interaction is so specific that variations in the sialic acid arrangement determines which species of animal an influenza virus can infect. Avian influenza viruses cannot easily infect humans. Now, during establishment of infection, attachment can occur between microbes and the host, but also between each other and even to foreign material. Some bacteria can secrete mucoid compounds that glue them together, forming specialized bacteria communities called biofilms. Biofilms can grow on catheters and prosthetic devices, as you can see in this image. Biofilms allow bacteria to hide from the immune system and from antibiotics, making these infections hard to treat and many times requiring removal of the device. I see a lot of these line infections in the hospital. And the hardest decisions involve our pediatric patients who really must have that central line in place for medications and nutrition to survive, but they've already had a number of line infections and in fact have a, lot, a number of new lines. I have to balance the desire to always take the line out with the practicality that the child may have very few open vessels for a new line. Now, leaving the old line in place brings on the hard decisions of, well, how long do you treat this infection? And also, what is the risk of recurrent line infections, potentially from the biofilm? Catheters are also a good example of how microbes can penetrate the epithelial barrier to establish invasive infection. Breakdown of the epithelial barrier is a common theme in the establishment of infection. And in addition to catheters, other skin defects such as burns and wounds can predispose a patient to infection. So here's a picture showing the legs of a man who is caught in a forest fire. To escape the fire, he had to slosh through a marsh. And not only did he get burns on his legs, he also got a bacterial infection of his wound with Pseudomonas aeruginosa. This is a bacteria that lives in the water and can cause severe infections and be difficult to treat. The epithelium can also be defective from anatomic defects, which are not as obvious as a penetrating catheter or a burn. So it's important to remember this. In fact, if you have a patient with recurrent infections in the same anatomic location, you might want to think about a possible anatomic defect. Let me show you an example. Some people are born with a connection between the trachea and the esophagus called a, a tracheoesophageal fistula. 
This fistula can carry the contents of material from one tube to another. Someone with a tracheoesophageal fistula may end up with oral secretions in their lungs. So here's an x-ray of a man who had recurrent pneumonias. After drinking a radio-opaque solution called barium, it outlined the dilated esophagus shown in the yellow arrow, arrows, and the barium also went into the bronchioles shown by the red arrows. This meant that there was a connection between the esophagus and the airways causing a defective epithelium and leading to a lung infection. The yellow arrow in the CT scan you see on the bottom shows the fistula between the trachea and the esophagus. Breakdown of the epithelial barrier can also be caused by drugs such as chemotherapeutic agents used to treat cancer. Uh, in the picture on the slide, you can see the oral mucosa has these whitish ulcerations, and similar lesions can develop all along the entire GI tract. Now, this particular patient has cancer and is receiving chemotherapy, and we call uh, this pattern mucositis. The mucosal defect predisposes patients to bloodstream infections with their own microbial colonizers. Some microbes are able to cross intact epithelial barriers to establish an invasive infection. One mechanism is to invade specialized cells of the immune system whose job is to transiently open the epithelial junctions to survey and sample the mucosa. So here you can see a dendritic cell. It's the brown colored cell, which is one of these specialized cells. The dendritic cell can sample the mucosa by extending thin cellular processes between the intercellular junctions of the epithelium. HIV, for example, can't invade epithelial cells directly because they lack the right receptor. But HIV invades dendritic cells in order to be brought across the epithelium. From here, HIV can spread to other cells. And this is thought to be how HIV first crosses some mucosal epithelial barriers without the need for a wound. There are other specialized mucosal epithelial cells that survey and sample the contents of the intestine. They are called M cells, microfold cells, found on the surface of the pyrus patches in the intestine. Several bacterial pathogens, like salmonella, can invade the epithelium through M cells and thus cross the intact epithelial barrier. Like salmonella, many pathogens invade cells as a way to establish an infection. This is true of all viruses since they require the host cell machinery for replication. There are several ways to invade cells for intracellular growth. Some bacteria, like mycobacterium tuberculosis, infect macrophages through phagocytosis and then survive inside the phagosome. Viruses mostly enter through endocytosis and then invade the cytosol. AP complexin parasites like plasmodium and toxoplasmosis use a sophisticated mechanism of active invasion to squeeze themselves into host cells. You can see Toxoplasma gondii gliding over to a cell and squeezing itself into the cell. Remember though that invasion is just one pathogenic strategy and many pathogens, for example, Bordetella pertussis, the bacteria that causes whooping cough, stays on the epithelial surface. It does not invade cells to cause disease.